So hello everyone, welcome to day fifth of the BHR course uh, 2020. I hope by far you have been having these useful uh, webinars and getting to learn a lot from them. Uh, today I am uh, we, today's topic is uh, in fact very uh, crucial and we have had a bit of discussion in our previous webinars uh, regarding the numerous challenges and the harassment that uh, any human rights defender has to go through and what is their particular role. There have been questions from you guys so I'm very happy to uh, introduce today's topic which is the role of human rights defenders and national human rights institutions in corporate accountability. Uh, to take us through their presentations today, I have with me Yerne, who is an associate professor of human rights and constitutional law at the new university, Slovenia. He is joined with Lorenzo, who is a senior program officer at the Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development. He's based in Bangkok. So without eating into much of your time, I will request both our presenters to take us through their presentations. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Lina, for organizing this course. And also thank you to Professor Surya Deva for inviting us. So it's a pleasure to be here again in this webinar number nine of the, of the virtual course on business human rights. Uh, and as uh, Elina mentioned, we will discuss uh, today with you the role of human rights defenders and national human rights institutions in uh, corporate accountability. You may remember from uh, other, other courses that uh, access, access to justice is one of the areas which is uh, still uh, very worrying uh, area in business human rights. Still there are many deficiencies, uh, much room for uh, improvement both at domestic and regional and uh, global levels. And in this area of uh, access to justice, uh, it's quite important to discuss also the role of uh, human rights defenders and national human rights institutions, uh, those individuals and those institutions who are, uh, you know, in the, in the first line of uh, fight for corporate accountability, who often risk uh, uh, not only their uh, professional livelihoods, their family lives, private lives, but also uh, often uh, their lives when uh, defending uh, defending human rights of uh, individuals and indigenous uh, peoples around uh, the world. Unfortunately, as we will discuss throughout uh, this course, there are many cases of uh, killings, oppression, detention, many examples of arbitrary excess of uh, power both by governments and, uh, and businesses uh, where they try to prosecute defenders, try to basically eliminate them, eliminate them in order to pursue their most often financial uh, interest. So today's uh, course uh, will basically discuss uh, four main areas, which are uh, uh, who are human rights defenders, uh, then we'll move on to national human rights institutions, which are mostly uh, institutions within the wider range of public administration of a particular country. Then we'll discuss also access to, to remedy. And then lastly, in the, in the uh, fourth the last uh, discussion, we'll discuss how can state national human rights institutions and businesses uh, protect uh, human rights defenders. And we'll try to make uh, our, our lecture as uh, interactive as possible. Uh, you can ask us uh, questions uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, we also have two poll questions for you and one hypothetical case scenario uh, we will go through uh, together. So let's start with uh, the content of our lecture. But before we start, uh, I would ask Alina to, to put the first uh, uh, poll question to, to our students. Uh, sure. and, the, and the first uh, poll question is, uh, do you agree that the protection of human rights defenders is essential for effective uh, regulation of business and human rights, both at national and global levels? And uh, you have uh, two possibilities to answer this, uh, this question.
And I can see that most of you is almost unanimous. There's a consensus that, of course, uh, the protection of human rights defenders it's uh, quite essential for for uh, advancing uh, the regulation in business uh, uh, in human rights. So now let's start with the, the question of uh, normative regulation of uh, human rights defenders. And uh, here I pass the floor uh, uh, to my uh, to my colleague uh, Lorenzo, and he will take you through the normative regulation. Thank you very much, Jarnet. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, warm greetings from Bangkok. It's very hot, so the greetings are indeed very warm. Um, it's very great. It's very great to see uh, that there is a, a consensus on, on the critical importance of human rights defenders. Uh, I have to say I'm not surprised, but yeah, that was an important question to ask. Um, so uh, this recognition of the role of human rights defenders is also reflected in the UN Guiding Principle on Business Human Rights. Uh, indeed, the UNGPS recognized its critical role, and even they recognized the defenders as being an integral part of the business human rights ecosystem. So we can see from the slide that there are two commentaries or two principles that specifically mention human rights defenders. Uh, the first one, uh, the commentary of the principle 13, which touches upon how business could identify actual or potential adverse human rights impact. Uh, you can see specifically mentioned human rights defenders when it comes to a situation in which business um, are not in the position to hold um, consultation with rights holder, then they should consider reasonable alternatives, such as consultative, credible, independent experts, including human rights defenders. Moreover, in commentary of the Guardian Principle 26, which is upon effective state-based judicial mechanism, uh, is clarified states, in this case, should ensure the legitimate and peaceful activities as defenders are not obstructed. So, uh, and if we can move to, to the next slide, uh, why, why are human rights defenders mentioned in the UN GPS? And, and, and moreover, who are human rights defenders? So we all agreed in the poll that they are absolutely critical, but who are human rights defenders when it comes to the UN system? How are they recognized? Um, a good start, a good first way to go about this question is to look into the so-called, uh, and it's so-called because actually the name does not include the word human rights defenders, ironic, the 1998 so-called Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. Um, it was adopted by consensus by the UN General Assembly in 1998. And you can see how Article 1 clearly stipulates everyone, and this is a key word, as the right individually or in association with others to promote or to strive for the protection and realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms at the national and international level. Here, I really would like to stress on the word everyone when we start to analyze in why human rights defenders. A second article that is also equally important, and again, there is a key word, is Article 12. Everyone has the right individually in association with others to participate in peaceful activities against violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So here comes the second keyword, peaceful. So the first one, everyone, uh, it helps us to understand and also to address one that is an ongoing debate. Uh, who can be, who cannot be a human rights defender? There is not an official list of who is a human rights defender. And the word everyone, I believe, that captures the nature of the concept of defender. The other keyword is peaceful. Without saying the activities to protect and promote human rights and fundamental freedom should be peaceful. Uh, just a quick reminder for all of us being a declaration, it is not itself a legally binding instrument. However, this declaration on human rights defenders contains a series of principles that are based on human rights standards protected by other international instruments that can be legally binding when state such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Moreover, this declaration was adopted by consensus by the General Assembly. What does it mean? It means that there is a strong commitment by the states to its implementation. Let's move to another uh, General Assembly resolution uh, from 2013. This one you can Sorry, Lorenzo. Uh uh, sorry to cut you in between. Yerne, can you mute yourself while Lorenzo is presenting because there's a lot of noise in the background. 
the echo is coming back. Yeah. Thank you, Yerne. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so let's look into what is um, a potential subcategory of the category human rights defenders, which is the one of women human rights defenders. This resolution is absolutely uh, critical. It acknowledges the extraordinary nature of the work of women human rights defenders. Uh, in this category, uh, as for Omeja, we include any women. Uh, human rights defenders can be any person of any gender defending women's rights or issues related to gender. Um, because of who they are and the nature of their work, uh, WHRDs in all regions across the world, they, see, they face significant abuses and violations from smear campaign to sexual and gender-based violence. And so it was very important for states to acknowledge and recognize that women human rights defenders conduct extraordinary work and they face at the same time extraordinary risk. A third one, which is way more recent from, from, from last year, it's a resolution from the UN Human Rights Council in 2019. Uh, this time, um, it recognizes the key role played by environmental human rights defenders. Um, again, a quick reminder, resolution of the human rights cancer are not per se legally binding, but they are an indicator of strong political commitment. Um, this was an important achievement, this resolution of last year, uh, for the protection of human rights, of course, for the protection of defenders and for the protection of environment. Uh, it, re it officially recognizes the key role played by the people who protect the environment. And this is also important when it comes to the UN system in the context of the Agenda 2030 and the related 17 SDG goal, uh, the defenders can play a crucial role when it comes to the protection of the environment and if you want to advance sustainable development. It's also, again, similarly for WHRDs, a recognition of the increasing risk that they face. And I would say particularly in this region, and we will see later how environmental defenders in Asia are particularly at risk. So now I'm gonna stop here and pass the virtual mic to Yerne uh, to continue the, the presentation. Yeah, so the, so the main question is uh, who are human rights defenders? And uh, uh, Lorenzo is right, uh, there is no full uh, binding definition. Uh, so one could say that human rights defenders are those who promote and protect human rights. And here we, talk, we can talk about more straightforward examples, for example, civil society activists, uh, those working on the ground. Uh, then the question, of course, is uh, can also businessmen, businesswomen be considered as a, uh, as a human, human rights uh, defenders? Uh, I would say that yes, particularly if they show commitment uh, by, by acts uh, to, to, to human rights, that they really work for human rights in practice. Then professors, academia, for sure, judges, uh, by default, probably by their function, uh, especially if they they are the levels where they also consider uh, human rights, uh, human rights, uh, they can be uh, human rights defenders. Government officials, um, yeah, sure. Uh, you will see later that uh, uh, those people who work in national national human rights institutions, uh, for for some, they may not be considered as. Uh, human rights defenders per se, uh, but nonetheless, uh, many of them, many of themselves consider, them, uh, consider uh, themselves as a, as a human rights defender. Students as well, so, I mean, uh, all of you who attend this, uh, this course and who work or, and will work in the future in this field of business human rights could uh, also be considered as a, as a human rights defender. So the definition is very, it's very, uh, it's very broad, and uh, one, one, one should apply a subjective approach to this, uh, to this uh, function, human rights defender. I would really very, you know, worried if uh, in a particular country it would be a, some kind of commission. And there, they exist in some countries where, uh, where government would define who, who is human rights defender, or where the government would say that a particular NGO or civil society institution uh, is to be considered as an organization of uh, promotion and protection of human rights. Uh, that is very dangerous, as we can see from some examples, uh, for example, from, uh, from Eastern Europe or Sub-Saharan Africa, where some governments, they want to control everything, and even that, uh, who is a human rights defender. Now, uh, uh, what human rights are most often at risk? Uh, when uh, human rights defenders perform their 
their work where they educate, uh, protect, promote uh, uh, human rights. Uh, one could say that uh, all human rights are affected, you know? but from the, from the cases uh, we will discuss later in the next slides, uh, you will see that uh, often the most basic human rights uh, or uh, those uh, who we consider them as absolute, as absolute uh, they are most often in danger, such as uh, right to life. You know, human rights defenders often uh, risk their lives when advocating for um, for human rights or trying to bring cases to to, to the courts or uh, trying to um, advocate their positions against the business interests. Then, of course, uh, often human rights defenders are detained. They are put in uh, uh, detention uh, prisons, uh, sometimes even a semi, you know, semi uh, labor camp or forced labor uh, camp. Unfortunately, there are some examples from around the world where human rights defenders, just for speaking their minds, are have been put in uh, labor camps or, if you want, even uh, semi concentration camps. Then, of course, the right to fair trial uh, is very important uh, because human rights defenders, of course, they, they can do a lot of advocacy work, uh, promotion of human rights, but then uh, what is uh, most important is how to you know, enforce corporate accountability, accountability before the uh, courts or, uh, or uh, semi-judicial organs or uh, governmental organs uh, or before national human rights uh, institutions. Uh, then, uh, most definitely, human rights defenders have a lot of challenges, particularly in low-level uh, rural law environments, to express their minds, to assemble, to associate, you know, to 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 work uh, within the civil society organizations. Uh, there are many examples, unfortunately, are from around the world where the governments want to squash. Uh, civil society organizations or put conditions on their functioning or to limit their funding from uh, external uh, sources, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, it might be a self-standing right, which is accepted in uh, most of the world, but still nowadays in 2020, uh, there is a lot of uh, problems with, uh, you know, advoca advocating for for rights within the business human rights uh, context, uh, people get prosecuted for expressing their minds or for criticizing both the governments and businesses. Uh, and then uh, discrimination is also uh, is very important uh, in this respect. Uh, and uh, also right to liberty and security concerning detention. So almost every human, every human right and freedom is, uh, is at stake uh, when human, human rights defenders perform their uh, their work. So let us uh, now uh, to give you some examples from uh, uh, from the field, uh, some examples of the cases uh, we theoretically mentioned uh, just now. Let us look at um, a few examples of uh, human rights defenders, uh, very courageous human rights uh, 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 defenders, uh, and we'll go, we'll go to the case a bit uh, later. Um, the first case uh, is, a, is a case of um, Angelica Schock. Uh, Angelica Schock is, is a very known human rights uh, uh, defender from, uh, from uh, Guatemala, part of indigenous Mayan uh, uh, peoples, uh, and uh, she has been advocating for uh, their rights uh, to land, to, uh, rights to preserve their way of living, indigenous way of living. And uh, unfortunately, in this fight, he, she, she, she several years ago uh, lost her lost her husband, who, who was also a human rights defender, um, and, and they were basically advocating uh, against uh, extractive industry project by a Canadian uh, multinational uh, company in a, in, a, in Guatemala. Uh, and uh, there were her husband and, and uh, another of his colle colleagues were killed uh, uh, by uh, security, prior security forces of, uh, of subsidiary of this uh, Canadian uh, uh, multinational. And uh, uh, 12 women were, were also raped by, uh, allegedly raped by private uh, security forces, that, that company. 
And Angelica is very is very well known uh, human rights advocate. Uh, uh, I got to know her uh, uh, several years ago at the Business Human Rights Forum in Geneva, which she very regularly attends. And out of this uh, case, out of these uh, you know violations, uh, she brought a case against uh, the the by Minerals. This um, this, uh, this this company, this Canadian company, before the Canadian courts, it's called Shock versus Hudbay Minerals uh, and uh, Cal versus Hudbay Minerals, uh, where they alleged, where she alleges, together with some uh, others, that uh, Canadian company uh, companies were extraterritorially responsible for violations uh, that uh, were committed. Uh, and this this case is ongoing. Just gen in January this year, the the uh, the court, the Canadian court, threw out uh, a motion, motion of the defendant uh, by the defendants to dismiss the case. Now, another very known uh, female human rights defender in business human rights uh, uh, was uh, Berta Caceres. Berta, Berta Caceres, unfortunately, she's uh, not anymore alive. She was uh, uh, shot dead at home in March 2000. Uh, 16, and she was a well-known uh, Hungarian indigenous and environmental uh, rights lead, uh, defender. Uh, nobody was so far, you know, convicted for her for her murder. There were some uh, domestic proceedings uh, in uh, in Honduras, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, nobody was convicted for her for for her uh, uh, killing uh, killings. So it's still a lot of. Uh, Unknown uh, on uh, as to who was responsible for uh, for for that, but her death is an example of many deaths in uh, Latin Central America of of uh, human rights defenders who were really fighting on on the first lines uh, for human rights of their um, communities. And then third example, third example, it's a it's a quotation from uh, from a case um, before the European Court of. Uh, of uh, uh, human rights in, in a case called Alio versus Azerbaijan. Alio, uh, Mr. Alio is a well-known human rights defender in uh, Azerbaijan, in Caucasus, and uh, he was uh, since many years subject uh, to threats by the government officials. Uh, they quashed down also his uh, civil society um, uh, organizations. And I put this reference here because it's one of the very few uh, references by uh, by regional courts uh, as to the role of human rights defenders. Uh, and uh, this case, in this case, European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, really directly indicates that uh, uh, and says and confirms that uh, the measures uh, by the government were aimed to to silence and to punish the applicants' activities in the areas of. Uh, Human rights, and as well as to prevent continuing those those activities. So, a very straightforward uh, language, and here we can see one of the prevailing characteristics of uh, persecution of human rights defenders is for governments and businesses to create chilling effects, you know, on uh, for the future uh, uh, or the for the for future human rights defenders in order to you know to to scare them off uh, from uh, pursuing their the their, their work. Now, so you can see three cases uh, of, uh, of uh, human rights defenders from their real life. And now, before uh, uh, before we uh, we move uh, forward, uh, we uh, we will look uh, at the hypothetical case which uh, we prepared uh, for you. And let's take uh, some uh, some minutes to. Uh, to acquaint ourselves with the uh, with the with the case, uh, I I can go briefly for uh, through the facts of the case, and we will return to this case a bit uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, later. Uh, it's a case about Swati. Swati is a member of indigenous community, and she was protesting against a local businessman uh, who was granted a license to extract rare minerals in a country X. Uh, but uh, the government isn't, didn't listen to her. Uh, in contrast, uh, they they uh, detained her and brought her to police uh, station, where 
the government officials, the police office, officers start to, started to beat her, started to abuse uh, uh, her uh, because she didn't want to change her, uh, her allegation as to the role of uh, Mr. Ivan, uh, terrible lo local businessman in, uh, in granting this, uh, in getting this uh, uh, license to, uh, to extract rare, uh, minerals in, uh, in uh, the territory of her community. Uh, and even, uh, you know, further, uh, the government later brought a case against Swati uh, for falsely accusing Mr. Terrible uh, of, uh, falsely mis uh, accusing Mr. Terrible of corruption. And she was then within a week convicted of, uh, of, uh, uh, of falsely accusing Mr. 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 Uh, Terrible. So the question which you consider, you can consider during the next, uh, uh, 50 or so minutes is what relevant uh, what rights are relevant here where can Swati turn to? okay uh, Lorenzo do you want to something to add or we, we move to national human rights institutions uh, no I just want to add on the case of Berta Caceres um, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's one of the, of, of the most emblematic cases of, of last year uh, she also received an award so i think there was a lot of media coverage and it's not always the case that the killing of defenders uh, it makes it to international media uh, i think just a, a punctualization uh, seven men were convicted just in december 2019 uh, for the killing of course those are the people that are believed to have manually executed the killing there is still a lot that needs to be done when it comes mm. to one who actually mandated the killing and it basically mm. just broke the first cycle of impunity for this case. Just yeah, very important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah. This is also a very concern. I, I can see Lorenzo, we have some questions here already in the chat box. Uh, uh, some of you, uh, Nasho asks, for example, if also media media activists or and it's, Samui also asked whether the media activists and writers uh, can be considered um, uh, as human rights defenders. For sure, no? all of us who protect and promote human rights uh, in our communities and at the global level can be considered as a, as a human rights uh, uh, defenders. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Let us now, now move to the, to the next issue, which is the issue of uh, uh, national human rights institutions, and I'll provide you some of the normative uh, normative uh, backgrounds as to the functioning of uh, national human rights institutions. Uh, the main uh, the main instrument uh, for uh, governing uh, regulating the role of national human rights institutions at UN level are so-called Paris principles relating to the status of national uh, human rights institutions, and uh, those Paris principles are not. Uh, UN treaty, there are soft law documents uh, which can provide evidence of a state practice. When we talk about national human rights institutions, of course, uh, we have to consider that there are many, you know, forms, uh, scopes, that their mandates uh, differ. Uh, but uh, the first section of the UN principles uh, says that national institutions shall be vested with the companies to promote and protect uh, human rights, and uh, we can find them in a, in the form of, for example, human rights national human rights institutes, or office of ombudsman, or uh, national human rights institutions, which have the name exactly like, like that, like for example, Indian uh, human rights institutions or the Philippines uh, national human rights uh, institution. What is very important here uh, to consider is. Uh, what are the principles which govern their their work? No, and it's very important to to insist on those principles. You can see on the slide. Uh, primarily, the the issue independence from the government. No, independence from the current current government. Of course, as we said, the national human rights institutions they belong to wider uh, public administration, but they should not be directly linked. And subject to the influence of the respective uh, incumbent uh, governments. Governments, in other words, governments 
should not or shall not interfere with the daily work of national human rights institutions in order to prevent uh, uh, corruption, conflict of interest, and abuse of uh, uh, power. So it's very important also for national human rights institutions uh, to uh, to be impartial, you know, to to consider both sides uh, of the story uh, when considering a particular case. It's also very important that in their workings they include a uh, wide range of wide range of uh, actors from society, you know, from civil society sector, from academia. From, uh, from the government, from other branches of, uh, of governments in order to in, uh, have a very pluralistic uh, picture of functioning of, uh, of, uh, of human rights. Of course, uh, one issue which is very important, which uh, Lorenz knows also very well, is a, it's an issue of uh, ad adequate, uh, adequate uh, resources. Uh, uh, in order to national human rights institutions to work, to work uh, properly and independently, they have to have adequate resources and often you know adequate resources are dependent on the budget of a particular state so here here is where the government can pressure on a national human institution and here where it's often often uh, we can see that some governments even cut the funding of the of the institution if they're not happy with their uh, recommendations or their of their workings uh, very important question, which we will also come back to, is the adequate uh, powers of uh, of uh, investigation. The mandates of um, of national human rights institutions they they differ uh, to a large extent. Uh, for example, uh, here in Europe, most of uh, most of national human rights institutions uh, would not have power to to consider uh, uh, you know complaints against uh, against the governments and uh, private. Uh, private uh, sector. You know, they would have only, you know, a power to to generally promote human rights. You know, to influence indirectly, uh, indirectly uh, government institutions and uh, business sector, but not having a, a direct legal mandate to handle complaints against uh, against uh, businesses. In this respect, uh, one has to also to man uh, to mention the Edinburgh. Declaration on the role of national human rights institutions in business and human rights, and this declaration um, was adopted uh, the meet, in the, meet, the meeting of uh, of uh, those institutions, and it has four important uh, uh, parts. Uh, part one is on promotion. Part B is on monitoring. Part C is on complaints handling. Uh, part D is on mediation uh, uh, and uh, conciliation, alternative dispute. Uh, uh, resol resolution. So, all in all, what is very important is that first that the institution is uh, independent financially from the government. Then, secondly, that it's plural in its handling, that it complies thirdly with the rule of law, and also, fourthly, it's, uh, it's it, it is wishful that the national human rights institution has uh, a power to receive complaints or at least to open a you know proper motto. Uh, inquiry into the issue of business, uh, uh, business and uh, uh, human rights. And at the late, uh, later stage, we'll also we'll also go through uh, three examples of national human rights institutions. So you will see three concrete cases how uh, those institutions handle uh, handle uh, complaints. I will pass the floor to uh, to Lorenzo. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was going through some of the questions and I believe that most of the topics addressed in the questions will actually be addressed by the presentation later on, but if it does not the case, we will come back. I think there is a very vibrant discussion going on and that's very good to see. So uh, I, a, a very uh, natural link to what Yerne was saying is that uh, the staff of national human rights institutions, the commissioners, the people working in the office of a national rights institution, they can be human rights defenders themselves. Mm -hmm. Human rights defenders can be human rights defenders. They can be then subcategories of defenders. Uh, because of the human rights work, oftentimes actually can happen that uh, staff or national rights institutions they face threats. Uh, they go through violation of human rights because of their work and who they do. So let's look now at the more general category of defenders. How can they? How can they facilitate the access to justice? 
and remedies. Um, let's look at some concrete ways in which they can help. Uh, first of all, defenders are extremely familiar with the legal and bureaucracy of, of the state. They've been defending their own rights, the right of other communities and people for probably many years, and hence they can advise. They can advise their communities on how to access state-based judicial or state non-judicial non grievance mechanism. Uh, they can also be lawyers, uh, defenders. They can represent communities in court and they can do this pro bono and they can provide legal support. Um, it's important to stress that a key step to secure remedy uh, in case of a corporate abuser, but in general, I would say, is often to provide evidence. You need to be able to uh, provide evidence that the abuse occurred or that is occurring and that is also effectively linked to the company's project. So what HRDs are particularly extremely skillful and experienced in doing is to bring abusers to light, is to investigate the actual or the potential effects of a project on the local communities, on the environment. And this is, goes back to the question that we got before. Can a defender be a journalist? Absolutely, yes. And that's why it is extremely critical, this work that they do, even in utilizing their journalism background and bringing the exposed the, the violation into media outlets and bringing the abuses to light. Uh, defenders can also um, assist businesses uh, in designing uh, and implementing the grievance mechanism. This is a very ideal scenario, but we cannot rule it out. Uh, they can ensure that these grievance mechanisms are trusted by the local communities, are accessible, are known by the communities, are transparent in terms of process and in terms of progress, just to name a, a few key features. And then if we can, uh, pass to the next slide. Um, defenders can also support uh, in, uh, in, in communicating to international mechanism and national mechanism. And here is another link with national institutions. Uh, first of all, let's look at the UN system. Uh, they can assist in sending communication that can also take the form of urgent appeals that can be sent to special procedures such as the UN Working Group on Business Human Rights or several other. Uh, relevant UN special procedures. Uh, the, in this case, it's very important that credible reports and information are submitted so that they can lead to remedies. Uh, that can also be sent these reports and information in the context of the UN treaty-based mechanism, if a relevant country is part, of course, in such a treaty. Uh, also, during the Universal Periodic Review, uh, there is a regular reporting process, and this kind of information can feed shadow reports touching on business human rights issues especially if the state has been involved, complicit or failed to act. This is a crucial uh, distinction to make. At the national level, what else can they do? They can engage, if possible, with the national contact points of, for the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Uh, the national contact points can provide mediation, conciliation platform uh, to resolve practical issues that arise when the implementation of the guidelines actually is not uh, is not in place. Uh, of course, it will depend on how effective and well resourced the national contact points are. A similar uh, discourse can be made when it comes to national human rights institutions. As Irene rightly mentioned, there is a strong difference in budget, in human resources and capacities with national human rights institutions. What defenders can do, they can help communities, victim to access these non-judicial mechanisms, such as national rights institutions. Uh, some of them are indeed equipped to investigate abuses. And if we can go to the next slide, I will show you a, a concrete example, which is in a way uh, a landmark case as well. Um, this case, uh, it's in relation to two countries, Thailand and Cambodia. Um, the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand has been in this case implicated in investigating abuses occurring in Cambodia. Um, I will guide you through the facts very quickly. Um, everything started when in January 2018, the Cambodian Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries uh, granted three temporary land economic concessions to what is uh, one of the fifth world largest sugar company in the world, Metropole. Uh, this was for sugarcane production in two districts of Cambodia. All these concessions were linked to companies linked to Metropol. Already in May 2007, the land concessions were marked and the villagers were warned to stop using the land, which was overlapping with the concession. 
in April 2008, the company started clearing the land. Now, throughout 2008 and 2009, reportedly more than 800 smallholder families were forced to give up their land, and they started losing income, livelihood, access to education, and villagers were also arrested for protesting. Uh, the photo that you see in the slideshow is of a village that was entirely destroyed to make way for a plantation. Now, in light of the recorded violations, uh, recorded by the villagers, by the defenders, by civil society, in May 2013, a Cambodian organization filed a complaint to the Thai National Human Rights Commission on behalf of 602 families affected by the project. Now, here is remarkable to highlight how the Thai Human Rights Commission started to investigate the human rights impact of a Thai company operating abroad. So in October 2015, the Thai National Human Rights Commission issued its investigation report and found Metropole in serious breach of its responsibility. Um, and he also highlighted how the company has an ongoing responsibility, even though the project was terminated in 2014, to provide compensation and other appropriate remedies for the losses and human rights impacts suffered by the villagers. Now, this is an ongoing case and is a landmark one because in April 2018, uh, a lawsuit was filed in Bangkok by two Cambodian citizens on behalf of 711 families, accusing the company of violently displacing them between 2008 and, 2008 and 2009. Uh, this type of suit, which is a class action, is extremely rare in Thailand um, and has been already labeled, as I said, as a landmark case because it will make the first time that a company in Thailand is sued in a Thai court for human rights violation carried out in another country. Uh, in July 2019, though, the Bank of South Civil Court ruled the case not suitable to be treated as a class action, but rather as a normal civil case, uh, pointing out issues or language barrier as the plaintiff could not understand Thai. Now, on 31st of July 2020, so in 21 days, there will be the verdict on the appeal of the ruling whether this is suitable as a class action or not. It is extremely important for two reasons. The first one, a negative verdict will mean that each of the villagers will have to go to Thailand as individuals. And of course, you can imagine the amount of financial resources that are needed to, for them to go to Bangkok and, 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 and go to court. A second reason, the second reason is because it would set a negative precedent uh, for the future of transboundary class action. It would be extremely important in the case of human rights abuses perpetrated by Thai companies abroad that the remedies can be accessed in the country of the company, also by the, the victims of the company of, of, of the country in which the company was operating. Um, now, I would personally now stop here, um, maybe to see if there is any clarification or comment before we, we proceed, or for your name to, uh, to input with any kind of reflection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a, there is a, there are many questions. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Lorenzo, maybe you could elaborate. Uh, there is a question: uh, What is class action? There is a question by Tarun Bartini, uh, and uh, there are some questions. Maybe uh, Lorenzo, you can you can uh, answer them directly in the in the in the in the chat room. And uh, let us look uh, also at some examples from. Uh, Another region. It's a region which is also known for very low levels of rural law, many attacks on uh, on human rights uh, defenders. Also in this context of business human rights, but also generally, it's a region of uh, Central Eastern uh, Europe. And here you have uh, one uh, one graph, one slide, one photo from Business Human Rights Resource Center, which. Uh, shows which countries from Central and Eastern Europe are most uh, effect, affected as to the attacks at the human rights defenders. And you can see uh, usual, usual suspects, uh, one could add, no? Uh, Russian Federation with 36%, and then Belarus, uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, uh, Azerbaijan, we already mentioned, Uzbekistan, um, uh, and, uh, Armenia, and most of, most of those attacks uh, concern uh, their investigation and their work in the areas of uh, labor uh, and anti anti corruption land issues property issues and most of the issues are very 
concerning also the civil, civil and political, civil political uh, uh, rights. And here, uh, what is interesting to see, I mean, what are the types of attacks? Uh, we, we haven't elaborated on that uh, in depth. Uh, attacks are, are different, you know, of different range. Uh, one could say that the most uh, mild attacks could be lawsuits you know, or, uh, you know, bashing at the social, at the social, uh, in social medias, then threats, intimidations, unfair trial, which is very prevalent, not only in uh, Eastern Europe, but also all around uh, the world, uh, with some exceptions. Then we have also um, some uh, some uh, examples of detention, and also one, what what one could add in this respect is the issue of uh, disappearances uh, and uh, and kidnap kidnappings, you know. And uh, there was also a question uh, in the chat room concerning uh, that concerning uh, uh, issue of uh, disappearance of human rights defenders in in uh, in uh, Pakistan. Uh, of course, states, uh, as you know, have obligation to to uh, to prevent such a, such a disappearances, and also then they have very very clear positive obligations to investigate, provide for fair, independent uh, uh, investigation uh, for uh, into these uh, acts of uh, dis disappear disappearances. And European Court of Human Rights in the last um, two decades. Have delivered uh, almost a uh, hundred judgments concerning countries such as Russia, Turkey, concerning the disappearances of uh, human rights uh, defenders. But not only, only human rights defenders, also also ordinary people uh, who just found themselves at the wrong time, at the wrong uh, at the wrong place, and they were you know, killed and then uh, buried at the unknown locations, and their families they don't know where where they are. So there are many different types of uh, attacks which states uh, uh, have to prevent uh, uh, where uh, businesses and states uh, endanger the rights of human rights uh, human rights uh, defenders. Lorenzo, I'm now again turning the slides to you. The floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we, we look at another critical region in the world uh, when it comes to human rights defenders. Uh, let's look now at what does it mean to be a human rights defender uh, in Asia. Um, Forum Asia, uh, the organization I work for, um, has been recording for several years violations against human rights defenders and, and categorized uh, through a database. Um, so now, taking into account a period that goes from uh, the 1st of January 2019 to the 30th of June 2020, we have recorded, and you should take these numbers with the, you know, what is important here are the trends, not the numbers per se, because of course our monitoring can never be as comprehensive as it should be. But it should give you an indication that we recorded in this time frame 730 violations against human rights defenders, including their family members, and also the NGO that are related to them in 19 Asian countries that we monitor. Now, interestingly enough, more than a third of these violations occurred in South Asia. Uh, for us, South Asia, we took into account when it comes to cases, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. India was the country with the highest number of records, as you can see, with more than 130, followed by Sri Lanka and Pakistan, with around 30 incidents recorded each. Now, if we can go to, to the next slide, uh, we can see a bit more in detail based on our data and our recording what kind of violations defenders in Asia experience. And this is particularly important when it comes to business human rights. The first one that you see is judicial harassment. Now, here there are 250 cases uh, that we recorded. And you can see uh, we are specifically mentioned an increased use of what is known as SLAP, Strategy Lawsuit Against Public Participation. What does it mean? Those are lawsuits that can be civil, criminal, or administrative, filed against the individual, including, of course, HRDs, who are exercising their freedoms of expression, association, or peaceful assembly to speak out or act on matters related to business operations in the case of our presentation. Uh, the main intention here with the SLAP is to silence or to intimidate the person from further 
engaging in criticism, public participation, or in similar activities. I will give you a concrete example on SLAP in Thailand. Since 2016, a Thai poultry company has so far filed a total of 39 criminal and civil cases against 23 defendants, including numerous defenders, migrant workers, academics, journalists, and all they were doing was to raise legitimate concerns about, about the working condition in this company, but this company sees this concern as different. Now, the suit had a chilling effect on free speech and overall on the legitimate work of the defenders, of the journalists, of civil society, and even encouraged, in a way, could encourage other companies to do the same. Um, this tactic also exhausts the, res the resources of the defenders, their financial resources. That is extremely expensive to cover lawyers' fees, and as we also said, is extremely uh, attacking their confidence and is chilling the free expression of the defenders and of the organizations. Um, in relation to judicial harassment, there is, of course, arrest and detention. Defenders are arrested, are detained. We have recorded 200 cases, at least, in this case. And in relation to this, of course, there is intimidation and threats and physical violence. Uh, if we can go to the next one, uh, let's have a look at the affected groups. And here, the, the first group, uh, it is connected to something that we will touch upon later, which is the, the dramatic situation of seat space in the region. The first group is media workers and pro-democracy uh, defenders. They result in the most affected group, around seven uh, one. 170 cases each. Um, they are followed by community-based defenders. This can include the land and environmental defenders that we've seen before for the Human Rights Council Resolution of 2019, as well as the women human rights defenders that we also seen before for the 2013 General Assembly Resolution with a slightly lower number of cases. Let's look now at the defenders' rights that we have recorded as affected uh, in the period taken into account. Uh, not surprising, unfortunately, we have seen judicial harassment, freedom of expression. We recorded at least 300 cases uh, of, of related to freedom of expression, uh, liberty and security. And this, I think, is very relevant when it comes to the hypothetical case showed by your name. Uh, with 210 cases, safe and healthy environment and freedom of peaceful assembly, which are all, especially freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of expression, critical elements of, of civil space. Lorenzo, uh, if, I, if, I, if I may, uh, just, just a common comment a bit briefly, because there are interesting questions in the, in the chat room. There's a question by Somaya, and she, she raises the question as to how businesses, they often work together, by, together with um, uh, governments, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, joint venture, they work in concert in... Uh, violating uh, the rights of uh, human rights defenders and those examples you just mentioned are a textbook example of the of the issues uh, very often governments you know take very important role in uh, in prosecuting human human rights defenders who work in uh, uh, business, business human rights and uh, um, that's why it's, all, it's, it's often you know Somalia is it's often very important to look at this from very general holistic uh, perspective perspective of uh, I call this a, a general rule of law, you know, situation in a particular country. You, you mentioned here in your in your question examples of countries such as Nepal, Bangladesh, India, Sri, Sri Lanka, uh, and, and so on. Uh, the main, you know, the, the regulation of business human rights and protection of human rights defenders in any country will be stronger if the domestic judicial and rule of law uh, system will be strong. You know, if you have a very strong institutions, if you, if you have individuals in the government, in judiciary, in national human rights institutions who are uh, competent, who are courageous, who will not take uh, bribes, who will not take uh, any pressures from political parties or any other uh, you know, interest group from businesses and so on, then, then, you, then you have very, very strong system. But of course, when you, you know, when you uh, when you work or defend human rights in a a very unstable environment, such as uh, perhaps uh, the countries you mentioned, or uh, Lorenzo works uh, works in Thailand, uh, also in Central and Eastern Europe, there are many more challenges. You know, because uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, 
and in uh, Subai and Lorenzo, you know your countries uh, where you work uh, better. Uh, often we found very weak institutions, you know, weak judiciaries, uh, uh, judges who are not uh, very courageous uh, to fight off you no know, challenges to their independence, impartiality. Uh, police officers who will take pressure from businesses and government officials. And then, of course, it's very difficult to defend human rights. You know, then then uh, we're witnessing these human rights violations, which Lorenzo just just mentioned. Uh, mentioned uh, liberty, security, uh, persecution of freedom of expression, uh, and and so on. So often, business human rights issues and uh, protection of human rights defenders depend on the on the ability of domestic systems, you know, to fight off this. These, uh, these challenges of uh, corruption, conflict of interest, nepotism, which are very prevalent in Global South, uh, but not only Global South, in any domestic systems. And the only question is how, how, how high will be the percentage of such, such case, cases? The most, the most successful are those countries where human rights defenders are protected and where they can count on very strong judicial uh, institutions to protect uh, their rights or the rights of those who they are fighting uh, for. Sorry, Lorenzo, I, I jumped into. No, here. no, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very important points, and I think it's yeah. a perfect introduction to, to the next topic because everything you mentioned, I think, is an indication of what is probably an abused uh, expression, a shrinking civil space, uh, yeah, yeah. which affects the judiciary, the political institution. And here in the slide, you have a quite green scenario to be honest when it comes to asia so here is uh through the lens of the silicus model which is a research platform where also forum asia participates in uh, which ranks city space into into five categories uh, i will share a link later so you can see the detail of what does it mean to be narrowed obstructed repressed and closed but let's focus here on the overall trend uh, the glaring fact on the map is that there is only one country in Asia, it does a green color, the color of open, which is Taiwan. This means that 95% of the countries in Asia, according to the Civicus monitor researches made by all of the NGOs who participated in this platform, are either closed, repressed, tracted, narrowed. You can see that the narrow, they are not even that many. So the situation is, is extremely grim when it comes to civic space. Let go to the next slide. I will show you how uh, there are some specific violations. Again, uh, we keep going back probably to the same issues because they are really the core issues uh, in the region when it comes also to defenders and civic space. You can see that from the Civic Monitor on the number one is censorship. Uh, what does it mean? It means that it means that it's extremely difficult where criticism, critical views, actually make it true because they are stopped before. This can take place online. Or they can actually take place offline. And of course, in this context, like China uh, plays a very critical role when it comes to censorship, also when it comes to the number of cases. But we see this happening in Singapore, we see this happening in Myanmar, in Bangladesh, in Thailand. The second one, restrictive laws. Those are used to stifle and criminalize civil freedoms. The same goes for criminal defamation. Uh, in there are still specific criminal information laws that are simply used to persecute this. And here it comes to harassment. Uh, HRDs, we have seen the data before, HRDs, defend, uh, journalists continue to be placed under house arrest, continue to be surveilled, continue to be given travel bans. And this is all form of harassment. And finally, the protest. And here we can go back to the hypothetical case study shared before. Uh, protesters are detained across the Asia Pacific region for peacefully protesting and expressing their dissent. Now, let's have a look so that you know, uh, we have a bit of a global perspective. How does it look like in the rest of the world if we can go to the, the world map? Uh, it doesn't look any better, uh, to be honest. Uh, you can see uh, only 10%. The world population lives in country where city space is ranked as open, only 3%. And in 2018, it was 4%. So actually, it's getting worse. Uh, I will send you the, the detail on the status monitor so you can go through if you want all the countries. But I think this can give you an idea of 
what is the situation of city space and what are the threats? Uh, I don't know, Yerne, if you have anything you want to comment on this or how, how did you feel when you look at this map? <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the the slide we were just we were just watching the it presents a fair picture of the of shrinking civil space around around the world. I think it's a it's a very worrisome trend uh, since perhaps uh, uh, the last decade. No, even in a, even in a, you know in a continent uh, such as uh, such as Europe, we are witnessing a lot of challenges as to. Uh, Rule of law, protection, human rights defenders, protection of independent, impartial institutions. Uh, and here, there are many, there are many questions in the chat as to the role of judiciary in protection of uh, human rights defenders. Uh, and I agree with you uh, that uh, judiciary can play a, a role of protection of human rights defenders. But of course, I mean, when we come to the judiciary, that is often a post facto. You know, when the when a violation already occurs, uh, when uh, when the NGO is already closed, then uh, human rights defenders go to courts to to ask for their uh, rights. So it's perhaps more important also to function also to focus on promotion of uh, of human rights. And here, the role of national human rights uh, uh, institutions is uh, super important, you know, to to prevent violations to to occur. To occur, of course, judiciary's role in Protecting human rights uh, is uh, is only only uh, applicable when uh, judiciary is strong, impartial, and independent. When it's not when it's not subjected to the you know to the pressures from the outside, but also pressures from uh, internally. Imagine uh, imagine cases where uh, higher levels of judiciary is, uh, are pressuring a lower levels of judiciary to decide a case uh, in a particular way, which is quite often the case uh, in a low level rule of law environment. Uh, as far, there, there was a question as to Indian judiciary. Uh, as far I, I, I know the Indian judiciary, Indian Supreme Court is very, is a very strong institution, so one at least uh, can, can depend on, on their, uh, their findings. But at the end, you know, the, 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 the most important question is not, how good are the normative regulations, you know, as to the function of judiciary and protection of human rights defenders? But mostly, how, you know, how do people who work in those institutions perform their duties? Do they perform the, the duties with integrity, professionally, fairly, honestly? Then uh, they can meet those uh, uh, those duties. But if uh, uh, if not, uh, if they allow uh, challenges to their, to their integrity, their honesty, then uh, we have a lot of uh, challenges as to protection of human rights, uh, human rights uh, uh, defenders. Now, let us uh, look just for a minute, sorry for that, uh, to the next slide, and we can uh, briefly address how national human rights uh, institutions facilitate access to justice and remedies and business in human rights. This is a, is a very wide question and it's a question which uh, has been uh, uh, recently discussed and investigated, examined by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations. If you're not mistaken, there is a report coming out uh, by the Working Group of Business Human Rights on this on these uh, issues, and uh, uh, there are several there are several ways how uh, how national human rights institutions can facilitate access uh, to justice. One way is directly through complaints mechanisms, uh, mediation, uh, and alternative dispute resolution. Uh, some of uh, national human rights institutions they have legal mandate to to bring uh, unusual cases before the courts. Uh, or to um, even conduct inquiries, proprio motto, to, to open a case uh, concerning particular matter in business uh, in human rights. Uh, it depends uh, as to the legal mandate, and we'll see just in a bit uh, free case studies of national human rights institutions uh, as to their legal competencies. Most importantly, and this is where there is a general consensus as to the competencies of uh, NHRIs uh, is uh, their indirect role to promote human rights, 
to you know by strengthening capacity of civil society by uh, studying uh, for human rights defenders uh, and providing and uh, funding legal assistance uh, to individuals uh, and then groups so there are many examples of uh, from around the world as to the function of national uh, human rights uh, institutions there is no you know universal rcp on how the legal mandate or the competence of national human rights should, should look but for sure national human rights institutions they have a role in providing access to justice perhaps not in a way as judiciary does in a in a legal judicial way but more in a in a soft way by uh, offering good offices uh, uh, by mediating between the 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 parties and offering you know the agreements uh, to be concluded between, between, before the parties uh, another way another competencies which um, nhris have is the are those of recommendation uh, nature most of them they have uh, you know competencies to to uh, bring evidence uh, to to the courts to to report to state uh, bodies to to report to international human rights bodies uh, to, to request meetings with state officials to you know to provide these soft uh, uh, powers in order to change uh, a situation of of uh, human rights defenders in business human rights. Uh, uh, but of course, I mean it depends also on a person who holds a, a position. In some countries, as you know, national human rights institutions they are they are collective bodies. Uh, you know they have more uh, commissioners in others it's only one person so it's often also depends on uh, you know on a, on a persuasive power of uh, individuals who hold these uh, offices uh, whether for example uh, president of the government accepts or receives uh, a last for meeting with the uh, with the members of uh, nhris uh, uh, president of supreme constitutional courts and to discuss a matter from business human rights now uh, let us look at uh, uh, three cases unless Lorenzo you want to jump in uh, I can go now through uh, three case uh, studies of uh, workings of human rights commissions uh, in particular cases uh, concerning business human rights no. please go ahead yes. okay okay I see we have uh, uh, a lot of questions and we'll go try to do go through them uh, uh, in a chat. But let us move on uh, uh, through, the, through the case studies. The first case study is, uh, is a case before the Commission on Human Rights uh, of, the, of the Philippines. And here I want to highlight uh, a particular case which, is, which was quite you know, uh, prominent uh, in the last years in the, in the debates on the business human rights and business and environment climate change uh, there was a there was an inquiry investigation conducted by a philippines uh, human rights commission uh, into uh, alleged accountability of, of 47 uh, corporations doing business in uh, extractive industries and, uh, and as to their contribution to climate and human rights uh, impact and the uh, philippines human rights commission here really did a tremendous uh, work had many hearings, uh, gathered a lot of evidence from around the world. Uh, a lot of uh, amicus security briefs were written. I was also involved in one uh, written by a group of professors arguing for corporate accountability. And at the end, uh, last year in the, in the winter, in December 2019, uh, the, the Commission uh, uh, provided a final recommendation as to the workings uh, of. Uh, of this um, extractor industry uh, companies uh, and the uh, commission concluded, concluded that those cases uh, can and should be brought into domestic courts under the national laws uh, and it also recommended uh, the government uh, uh, to to reform the legal uh, system in order to ensure access to justice for effective uh, community so this is this could be one uh, positive example of how uh, National Human Rights Commissions could contribute uh, uh, to, uh, you know, debates in business human rights uh, to provide, you know, evidence uh, for legal reform and also to provide uh, possibility for victims uh, to have, you know, their day 
in a hearing to, to present their their arguments. Now let us turn to the. Sorry, your name. Sorry, your name. Sure. I, I just wanted to add a very sure. short uh, reflection sure. on on the Commission of Human Rights of the Philippines. Uh, this is sure. something that you mentioned before as well. Uh, in 2017. Uh, the, the House of Representatives of the Philippines give a budget to the Commission uh, of around $20. Yeah. Uh, of course, you can imagine how with $20 it's not possible to conduct any work. The budget was then, you know, be adjusted and given a, a, a real one. Uh, but this is really a, a, an example of how a government uh, can actually even go against a national rights institution when it feels threatened by the work of a national rights institution. At the same mm. time, still in 2017, uh, Duterte uh, questioned mm. whether the, the chairperson of the Human Rights Commission of the Philippines is, uh, is a pedophile, that's what he said, because mm. he's keep asking about the killing of teenagers in the context of the war on drugs. Mm. So this is the kind of defamation that can happen from a government to a National Human Rights Commission. And I think in the region, the, the National Rights Commission of the Philippines has been one of the most vocal and unfortunately one of the most targeted. Yeah, the text of rights, yeah, this is the issue. I mean, uh, how can the National Human Rights Commission work properly if, uh, if uh, they cannot, uh, if they don't have financial resources to perform uh, the, the, their duties, you know? And, uh, Unfortunately, it's a textbook example how a government can influence uh, a national human rights uh, institution by cutting the uh, uh, resources. Now, uh, let us uh, move on to, uh, to the second case study. It's, uh, it's a study of Kenya National Human Rights uh, uh, Commission. Uh, and also, Kenya National Human Rights Commission has a legal mandate to, to conduct inquiries, uh, proprio motto, into, uh, into an issue which uh, comes to their attention, and in 2006 uh, they uh, they conducted uh, inquiry uh, into salt mining in Malindi dis uh, district, and uh, they also conducted uh, uh, an audit. And here you have an extract uh, from uh, from the from the report uh, where they uh, recommended uh, uh, improvements as to the health and safety in the mines. Uh, they also recommended uh, the government to, to reform the law and uh, to, to put in place uh, uh, health and safety mechanisms. But one thing one has to you know, highlight here is that, of course, one should not expect uh, miracles from national human rights institutions. National human rights institutions are those, those, uh, those institutions which can highlight a problem in society, but a lot then depends on a political will in in a parliament uh, to change the laws. And also a lot depends on the government judiciary to supervise whether these recommendations from the commissions uh, are, are being uh, implemented. Now, uh, let us move to the second, the third uh, example. It's, uh, it's uh, from Europe, from here, from German, German Institute uh, for Human Rights, which is a designated national human rights institution in the Federal Republic of Germany. And here I want to, highlight what are the, the problems also here in Europe as to the mandates of legal of uh, national human rights uh, commissions. Uh, uh, and the German Institute for Human Rights uh, is not competent to handle complaints or gather information as to the uh, business related human rights uh, uh, abuses. Uh, it can draft the MICUS briefs and uh, promote uh, uh, human rights uh, and also uh, take on advisory role in different uh, government commissions and committees. Uh, it can also take part in peer review of a German OCD national contact contact point, but it doesn't have you know this uh, proper legal uh, uh, legal mandate to handle complaints, which uh, is very common across uh, across uh, Europe. But nonetheless, uh, one could say the German Institute for Human Rights is an example of a national human rights institution uh, which has very weak you know normative powers but still can do a lot of work a lot of work uh, in the field of business human rights it is it is the german institute is very present present in the discussions on uh, on business human rights not only in germany but uh, beyond uh, 
in Europe is very instrumental nowadays for advocating for a change in German legislation as to the uh, compulsory due diligence requirements. It's, there is a proposed proposal which is, which is under discussion just now in a, in, a, in Germany. So it can, you know, uses its powers in a, in a different way, but not uh, uh, in a way which would directly, you know, defend uh, human rights um, persons, human rights, uh, uh, human rights uh, defenders. Now. Uh, we can uh, have a second poll, and I will ask Alina to poll, to put on the second question. Alina, can you hear us? Yes, Yone. So the second post, uh, poll question is now live. Uh, I, uh, uh, Yone, can you read that for us, sure. or I can do that for you? Sure. The the question is. Uh, who is responsible to protect uh, against uh, human rights violations by businesses? Uh, are those uh, businesses, states, human rights defenders themselves, or national human rights institutions? Okay. As we participants are, are requested to. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. As we are getting very. Uh, responses, maybe Lorenzo, you could uh, perhaps uh, address how can different actors uh, protect human rights defenders. Sure, thank you. Uh, it's very interesting the the results. I think I don't know if they are still coming. Uh, yeah. Yeah, seventy three now percent answering state, uh, and there is an equal thirteen percent with businesses and human rights defenders themselves. Um, the, the, the poll is still ongoing, but uh, let, let, let's make it clear. Uh, states' uh, international human rights law obligation require that they respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of individuals within their territory and or jurisdiction. Uh, this, of course, includes human rights defenders. Uh, they should be free to conduct their legitimate, peaceful uh, human rights work. So now it's final. We have business 14, human rights defenders 13, and state 73. Uh, yes, correct. States are, supposed to, are responsible to protect mm. human rights defenders against violations. It doesn't mean that businesses do not have a role to play. But here we're talking about the responsibility to protect. Um, also, in the interest of time, um, I will go through uh, three initiatives. Uh, that are worth highlighting when it comes to what the state can do to protect human rights defenders, given the fact that we said uh, it is their responsibility. The first one can take the form of national action plans. Uh, you have heard, I'm sure, in the previous session about national action plans on business human rights. Uh, in Asia, the first one has been developed by Thailand. Uh, these national action plans can include a specific reference to human rights defenders. Uh, ideally, there should be even a plan for a baseline assessment to determine what protections are available for defenders against violations such as SLAP, for example, and what are the commitments and measures that the state is willing to take. For example, the state can be willing to have a strong anti-SLAP law and penalize the businesses that are found to file these kind of lawsuits. Uh, in all this, it's important that these national action plans, like the one on business human rights, uh, flesh out collaboration with civil society organization, national human rights institution, businesses, of course, and direct engagement with the defenders. Now, one of the measures that can be included in a national action plan on business, on human rights, for example, can be the drafting and the enactment of a specific national human rights defenders law. So to provide a legal recognition of human rights defenders, and, and of the fact that they are targeted in the country, uh, design robust protection mechanism for defenders under the national legal framework. Uh, there are ongoing efforts in Asia. Uh, interestingly, uh, the country that has made the most progress together with uh, Mongolia so far in Asia is the Philippines. And we have in our among our attendees, I think there is a very active participant from the Philippines, uh, the Philippines were, according to the Human Rights Group Global Witness uh, latest report in 2018, the country with the highest number of killings in the world 
of land and environmental defenders, with 30 defenders killed at least based on their record. The second is Colombia with 24, and the third is India with 23. So an HRD protection law will be more than needed in the Philippines, uh, I would say in the rest of the world, as well as other Asian countries, uh, because of the very dark situation we defenders are in the region, as you have seen from the data shared before. The third one is to support the development of national or regional defenders network, you know, or if they exist already to strengthen existing ones in coordination with the defenders. These networks are particularly instrumental in providing fast protection and outreach to remote areas. Um, they can also be a, a, a share space to share best practices, lesson learned, and also to connect with other existing networks, increasing the protection and sense of security of the defenders. Um, national human rights institutions have acknowledged the importance of national HRD network in the Marrakesh Declaration. This declaration uh, is, a, is a landmark one when it comes to human rights defenders because in HRIs acknowledge the key role played by defenders in contributing to the realization of human rights and even acknowledge the critical work of women human rights defenders. So what can national human rights institutions do to protect HRDs? We have seen some examples before, and if we can go to the next slide, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, national human rights institutions are a state apparatus, so we are still in the category of state. In fact, there are state bodies funded by the state, but they should be operating and functioning independently from the government. And we have seen, and I'm seeing some questions and comments, that is not always the case. Um, what they can do, first of all, is to, uh, first of all, set up and then make aware about the mechanisms that are accessible for the protection of defenders. Uh, they can be ideally a focal point, a protection desk within the national rights institution, so that the defenders can seek and, and find protection. They can facilitate pro bono legal support. Uh, they can provide psychosocial support to the defenders and to their families. This is a very critical element, and oftentimes it's probably not addressed properly. Uh, it's not only about the defenders, it's also about the family members of the human rights defenders. Think about the stress and burden in which they are because of the violations and threats and abuses that their family members who are defending human rights, they are uh, positioned to. So a psychosocial support is a very important activity that can be undertaken and take the lead by the national rights institution. What they can also do, and I saw a question here way before, uh, they can set up temporary relocation mechanism. So there was a question, can a defender leave the country and go to a safer one? Well, this is complicated and will need a separate session, but the NHRIs can set up, and there are some uh, NGOs, civil society organizations that are also working on this. A temporary relocation mechanism based on which the defenders can leave the country or the region or the district uh, where they face risk and move to a safer one. Um, and then finally, the NHRI should have a meaningful and institutionalized engagement and collaboration with the civil society to protect the HRDs. Uh, this means that this kind of collaboration and institutionalized engagement should not be uh, something that happens uh, rarely, but it should be uh, a, a continuous engagement with the stakeholders, such as defenders and civil society. If we can go now uh, very quickly to the next one, um, to the next slide, uh, what can businesses do? Uh, this is probably something that uh, has been already touched upon maybe other sessions. Uh, probably here we need to ask ourselves and reflect on why. You might ask yourself, okay, why are businesses are supposed to protect human rights defenders? Why would they care? We need to have an assumption here. Uh, responsible businesses cannot thrive in closed societies where there is corruption, where there is cronyism, and when fundamental freedoms are violated. So when it comes to acting as well, responsible companies, of course they evaluate the cost of the action of protecting fundamental freedom of defenders, but there is also a cost of inaction and you will see a concrete example later on why sometimes businesses are actually speaking up for defenders and civil society. So companies can take different actions to protect defenders. A first obvious move, they could directly approach governments. You know, they use the same tactics that they use to promote their commercial interest, to push the message that the burden on civil society, on defenders 
shouldn't be greater than the burden placed on them. They can also take into account the possibility that the host government might not be very willing to listen to a business coming to them and telling them, hey, it is very important for you to protect defenders and civil society. In this case, companies can influence host governments by leveraging the influence of their own home government. They can do this, for example, through embassies and have them being an ambassador in this sense for the importance of protecting human rights defenders and civil society. And finally, companies can also undertake public initiatives. And in this regard, uh, it's very important to recognize how uh, they can do so by uh, doing it in, in, in a group, uh, even with their own competitors, even with other brands that are competing for the same market, they can come together and push for the same message. You can see here on the next slide, uh, there is the image of um, this image of a letter signed by some of the major uh, garment, footwear, travel good companies. I'm sure you can recognize many of them uh, working with suppliers in Cambodia. Uh, they address this letter directly to the Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen. They recall that there have been previous meetings and letters stressing how, despite some progress, they are still concerned. And you can see in the letter, I mean, you cannot see it's very small, but I can tell you the letter is very specific. They call, for example, to the repeal of a specific law that infringes on the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. And also they call for the cease of judicial harassment against labor activists. So these are concrete examples of companies coming together, calling for the protection of civil space and defenders. Uh, I will now pass it to, to Yerne, as we are also probably uh, close to, to the end, I don't know. Oh, Yerne, we, we cannot hear you. Thanks, thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, very pertinent questions as to as to what Lorenzo was just talking. Uh, sorry that we will not be able to answer all all of them, but. Uh, at least we can try to answer some of them. This is very, it's a, it's a, it's a very pertinent question uh, by uh, Somia, uh, and we can maybe answer the question together uh, with uh, solving uh, the hypothetical case. And Somia asks the question: uh, How can uh, how can the judiciary uh, provide uh, assistance in in protecting human rights? Uh, the uh, defenders uh, and she, she highlights this discrepancy between implementation implementation and normative regulations in this uh, area of uh, protection of business human rights uh, uh, defenders and perhaps we can uh, try to solve uh, before we conclude uh, our session uh, try to solve this case uh, concerning Swati and uh, you, you can uh, I invite you to, to go back to this case, perhaps at uh, later stage, or perhaps some of you are also uh, human rights teachers, or perhaps in your organizations where you where you work, you can discuss this case. It's a case case concerning Swati, and uh, Swati is a human rights defender. And she was prosecuted for uh, raising her words for assembling with others and uh, protesting protesting against a local businessman. And the government, instead of protecting her, as we can see from the from the facts, uh, started to prosecute her. You know? uh, and uh, this case shows uh, uh, many challenges which we often face in this uh, area of business and human rights. That many countries have uh, very modern laws as to the human rights protection, both at, at constitutional and statutory levels, and they have their parties to. Uh, International Human Rights uh, Treaty, but when it comes to, you know, to practice uh, defending those rights in practice, uh, those uh, rights are often uh, protections are often in vain. You know? So the first question is, uh, what are right? What rights are relevant here uh, in this case? Uh, and there are many many rights which could be uh, identified uh, as being violated. For example, right to peaceful assembly. Uh, and then uh, freedom of expression, and then as to the events at the police station, one could uh, identify uh, violations of prohibition of torture and human degrading treatment. Then as to the 
as to the <coughs> conduct of judiciary in that particular state X, uh, we could uh, obviously identify violation of uh, right to independent impartial tribunal, uh, right to relation right to fair trial. Uh, so there are a lot of issues which are often uh, involved in uh, persecution of business and human rights defenders. And then the second question, which you pose uh, uh, quite quite a lot in the chat room, where can Swati turn to? Where can a human rights defender, which is being prosecuted domestically, turn to? Now, uh, and Lorenzo, Lorenzo, maybe you could add, uh, later a bit. Uh, of course, I mean the first forum would be domestic system. You know, we often uh, repeat uh, uh, and say that human rights are best protected domestically. So first try it domestically by going by to, to judiciary, to quasi-state um, institutions uh, such as National Human Rights uh, Commission. There was a question concerning Indian Human Rights Commission, at least formerly Indian Human Rights Commission, takes a lot of cases concerning human rights uh, defenders and has the legal mandate to hear uh, concrete uh, uh, cases. Uh, and then also perhaps that doesn't, that doesn't work and uh, it doesn't work, try to, some, try to resort to bottom-up approaches, you know, to, to pressure civil society pressures. And uh, our very active participant, uh, Voltaire, uh, she mentioned that they, uh, in Philippines, they, they by uh, civil society pressure, uh, pressures, they, they pressure uh, the government uh, to, to, to allow for funding for Philippines uh, human rights, uh, a commission. So these approaches could uh, could work, but if domestic approaches do not uh, do not uh, do not work, uh, try to turn to regional or global levels. There are many UN human rights bodies, also UN Human Rights Council that it has uh, special complaints uh, procedures. So there's a many many avenues uh, available. Lorenzo mentioned national contact points under OECD guidelines. Uh, so there's a there's a vast array, array of possibilities available, but of course it depends on the strategy where you want to lodge your complaint. Uh, uh, Lorenzo, I, I turn to you uh, to, to, to finish our, our session and from my side I thank you all of you for your questions and Lorenzo and myself we are available to, uh, for contacts and future debates uh, through our emails and uh, social media Twitter accounts. All the best. Thank you very much, uh, Yerne. Uh, thank you, everyone. Really, the participation has been incredible in the question. I will try my best to, to, to reply. I don't know if the, the question can remain on. Uh, just a final reflection on where can SWATI turn to? I think it really depends on the context. We have seen how the city space situation is very different across Asian countries and the world, but actually it's, generally speaking, shrinking. Uh, there are national mechanisms, there are international mechanisms, at the end of the day, what is important is also to make the case be known and to make sure to reach out to as many organizations and institutions as possible. Because we have seen the case of Berta Castres was particularly known and she was a, an incredibly famous defender. There are many defenders that are killed, that are persecuted, and unfortunately the story, it doesn't make it to international media. So the work of NGOs, the work of national rights institutions is also to make sure that everyone as much as possible can receive protection and access to remedies. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, as you said, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. And thank you very much to Oxfam India for the amazing support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Yerne. I see a lot of questions have already been uh, addressed by our presenters, but there was this one question, if anybody of you would like to address, I mean, uh, this is uh, coming from one of our participants from the Facebook Live, and she asks uh, Anu Chatterjee, how businesses can uh, safeguard rights of immigrants? So do you, do you see, uh, I mean, in terms of human rights defenders going to national courts and uh, judiciary first and then uh, seeing uh, all the other options available, but do you see that how uh, these immigrants can be, uh, you know, can get, uh, seek justice? Would you like mm -hmm. to throw some light on that? Perhaps, yeah. Of course, businesses, uh, first they have to comply with uh, national laws. And often national laws are very strict as to the 
treatment of uh, refugees uh, and, and migrants. Uh, they provide very high standards as to the protection of human dignity. And businesses, of course, uh, as legal subjects of uh, legal citizens, they have to comply with these uh, regulations. But apart from that, of course, businesses, if they want to be known as a, as a, as a company, for example, uh, which is a human rights friendly or who wants to put a, a special emphasis on human rights, they should do more. Perhaps they, they, they could uh, think of uh, measures of positive discrimination, you know, try to you know, help also migrants to integrate, uh, not only in a, in a workplace, but also generally in a, in a, in a country where they, they came from. Thank you. Lorenzo, Thank you, Yerne. Lorenzo, do, do you have anything to add on this? No, no, nothing to add. I think it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very complicated one, as you may say. It really depends also on national legislation, national content, national laws. Uh, and probably it would be an interesting topic for a separate session, I would say. Sure. Thank you, both of you. For It was a pleasure having you both and hearing you about this topic. I thank, thank all the participants as well who could find time and join this session. Thank you for your questions. I request everyone to please submit their feedback forms uh, once the session is closed. Thank you and hope to see you in our last webinar for today at 4 p.m. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. You. thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.